So, Richard, to me, it looks like Lachlan Murdoch is incredibly thin-skinned in relation to the Crikey versus, or the Murdoch versus Crikey case in Australia. Thin-skinned, but also significant reputation damage, in my opinion. Look, I think, Peter, there's some real validity to that. It's, It's often said that when a defamation plaintiff sues, they put their whole reputation and their whole whole life really um, under the microscope and indeed one of the things in the crikey case that we see is that they plead that that Lachlan Murdoch has a very poor reputation in Australia particularly by virtue of his association with Fox Uh, so if he loses that might be one of the reasons why he loses. What are the aspects of the court case that are particularly interesting to you? Well, the, I think the first one is an element of any defamation, almost any defamation case, has the plaintiff been identified? And the article refers to the Murdochs a couple of times. As I understand it, crikey say we weren't referring to Lachlan Murdoch as an individual. We were referring to the Murdochs, you know, loosely as a group, and really we were talking about their interest in Fox uh, and in what the Fox media outlets were publishing, so they say they weren't. They don't identify Lachlan Murdoch. He obviously says that they do. Um, there is then the uh, of the the question present in every defamation case of whether the publication is defamatory. I think there's very little doubt that it prima facie is. You know, but associating somebody with with the Capitol riots and with the fairly unhinged claims that that Trump was making about the election being rigged and uh, I, I think is defamatory. So then, it, as often is the case, um, things turn to defences, um, and the um, the defence that will be um, what the, one of the defences, which is a new defence that will be in play since it hasn't been available prior to uh, July twenty twenty one, is the public interest test and whether Crikey can show that the case is in the public interest. But before we get there, Lachlan Murdoch has to satisfy. Uh, an additional new element that plaintiffs need to prove, and that is the serious harm test. So prior to 2021 in Australia, if you could prove that there was a publication that identified you and that was defamatory, uh, you, you you had proven your case and you would win unless the defendant couldn't get up, get up on a defence. Now there's an additional element um, of the serious harm test. The serious harm test was introduced to try and weed out claims that the court feels uh, the courts feel are less serious. Their claims between one individual and another in relation to social media publication. Yeah, well, there's a tangential thing to do with that. And when I speak to media lawyers, um, some of them say that if you're a high-profile person, you should have thick, thick enough skin and have the ability to defend yourself against these allegations. And so they should never get to court. Yeah. The other side... The other lawyers that I speak to say that a um, high-profile person is the same as anybody else and has the right to sue. So there are two ex- two extremes. Um, and my opinion generally is that if you are a high-profile person, you should be able to defend yourself in, in the court of public opinion. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, that if you happen to be a Murdoch and own a media outlet or two, uh, you clearly have your own means of defending yourself uh, through your own publicity. Um, I, I, it, I mean, it is very interesting to see uh, Lachlan suing for defamation. I think Rupert Murdoch has been on record many times saying that he doesn't believe that that journalists should sue. And he, he, he himself, I think, has often demonstrated he has a very thick skin about what people say about him. So then it comes down to freedom of the press and there's an interesting contrast between the court cases that the Murdochs are having to defend in the United States and this one in that both involve freedom of the press or the argument of freedom of the press, except the Murdochs find themselves on opposite sides in in both cases. That's exactly right. So so as I said, the, um, the public interest defence is one that Crikey is relying on in the in the litigation here. Um, and so so what they will be seeking to say is we want to rely on this brand spanking new defence of public interest uh, and that we say it is in the public interest to have a legitimate discussion about the role of the media in reporting 
the outcome of the US election and the capital rights and so on. Um, Lachlan Murdoch is saying um, that the defence will not protect them. And in one of the uh, early interlocutory hearings in, in the case against Crikey, um, his barrister, Sue Chrysanthu, um, said that um, the media had been sold a pup in relation to this public interest defence, that it's, it, it's toothless and it doesn't work. Now, I suspect that there are a significant number of uh, Murdoch employees and Murdoch media lawyers who were pretty horrified to hear that said because um, the Murdoch outlets in Australia and the media more broadly in Australia has pinned a lot of hope on this public interest defence. In other words, greater press freedom. Greater press freedom, absolutely. It, it, it's saying the truth of our allegations is less important and less relevant than the importance of airing the debate. Where, in your view, does press freedom lie between the two? Is it is it are you in favour of um, what Crikey is saying, or are you in favour of what Dominion is saying? As someone who's traditionally been a defence media lawyer, acting for um, for media outlets here in Australia. Um, I clearly have a, an affinity to the to the the crikey argument. Uh, I mean, it's been it's often the example that is often used is the Watergate scandal, and what has been said is that you know when you look at Watergate, um, that is one of the greatest examples of, uh, of investigative journalism uncovering wrongdoing and bringing down a president, and that you know we all know that. The question is. Could, water, could the Watergate uh, reporting have happened in Australia? And I think the view is, well, probably not, because the only way that it could have happened was if the media were comfortable that they could prove the truth of what they were saying. Very, very difficult when their source was a deep throat who could never have been called to give evidence. They did know it was true, and ultimately we all know that it's true now, but how could you ever have proven that? And, and so you you hope that the new legislation or the modified legislation in Australia would now capture that, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So improved press freedom, improved public's right to know, um, slightly more risk for high-flying businessmen, politicians and the like who do, and footy stars for that matter, who do the wrong thing. That's right. And, you know, the, the public's right to know um, does, I think, carry with it a responsibility for the media because it, it, the other side of the, of the coin is also important, that the media should not have free reign to make stuff up about people and say, oh, it's in the public interest to run this. It doesn't really matter whether what, what we want to say about the Prime Minister is true or not. It's always in the public interest to, to examine the Prime Minister's fitness for office. There's got to be some limits around that. Um, I think it's it much easier to understand um, the importance of a public interest defence when you have a high profile plaintiff and particularly someone who has a lot of control and influence and power and ownership of media. It's always going to be harder to, to, to um, make out a public interest defence when the target of the story is not a public figure. And, and, and I think that's right. I think that that's an indication of um, how the balance ought to be struck. Richard, thank you so much. Really interesting. Great to talk to you, Peter. We'll see you next time.